Welcome to today's conversation about what is a sustainable art practice. And we have some really incredible panelists gathered from an artist point of view to curator to community builders to share that discussion about what, what do we imagine when we think of a more sustainable art practice. And I am moderating from Imagine 5, and we're an organization that believes in creating a sustainable future by spreading contagious ideas. And we were really excited to take part in this because these are the people that are spreading these contagious ideas. And uh, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting conversation to have. So I will introduce who we have here today. And we have, um, we have Krzysztof um, Sandrovich. He is from Poland and an interdisciplinary curator sociologist, researcher, project facilitator, and activist. I would say it's very long and, and nice slash career. <laughs> we have Karina Hammer uh, from Louisiana Museum of Modern Art as the sustainability manager. We have Elise Pello, um, a French artist, also part of the Futures 2020 talent. And we also have Jakob Talko, uh, who is the co-founder and director of Beardicti Kulturleo. And also Daniel Hinks, who is a photographer both living in China and the UK and bringing his art piece, The Sunshiners, Code Red in Green China here <coughs> during the festival. So to kick us off, we will have a little presentation from some of the individuals and then dive into a discussion um, for about an hour leading into a little break and afterwards take each of the panelists and go outside for a later continued discussion on a specific question to reflect on. So I will pass it on then to Elise, I believe, yes, a shared microphone. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you. I'm really happy to have this talk with everyone today. Uh, so I'm an artist photographer, uh, as you know, and my thing is really to work about issues which are invisible politically, but also invisible to the naked eye. So today um, I'm going to present you the project here to just looking at the sun with closed eyelids, which is also a project that I present here in the Copenhagen Festival. So um, I did this project um, in the COVID, in the first lockdown. At the beginning, I was just able to look uh, at a place um, to escape and to have freedom. And I unexpectedly, unexpectedly discovered the place of Lomel's Sahara, which is a place very ambiguous because it had been so polluted by the past, by emanations of zinc industry. And so all the vegetation disappeared. And so today, pines have been replanted and they are able to survive only through a coexistence with the fungi, which is naturally present on the ground. So I really wanted to show this toxicity, which is totally invisible, but also the fact that it's in re re regeneration. And also, all the effects you can see on the images, not here, yeah, like here, for example, have been made with waste and things that I found on the ground of the Sahara as a filter to look at through the pollution. So for me, it's also another layout to show this invisibility uh, of waste because, because of the waste are present on the territory. They are part of the history of the place. They become part of the history of the place. So in my practice, um, normally, I was not, my approach is not like doing things with waste. But when I am investigated places for photography and I discover every time all this waste on the ground, I was like, I can't do nothing and just speak about the other uh, topics as if it was nothing uh, politic. Yes, and it's a one day project because it was during the COVID. So it was also something with time uh, a bit contra contradictory doing this project really fast in one day uh, and in the same time so taking times after to get through the pollution. 
Um, and I think it's also keys that I give to the viewer <coughs> to asking themselves why this aesthetical is a bit science fictional, why it's red, because there is no post-production. And for me, it's a way to bring them on a surrealistic world. Uh, and yeah, just give keys to ask, to ask questions. Because I think today we are on a really big flow of images. And for me, th this kind of aesthetical could, could attract the viewer uh, to interroge themselves about what we are looking. Uh, and then uh, I can present my new project. It's called Algemodit, a sea of tears. So it's a project about cursed algae in Brittany, north of France. I've worked, I've worked with scientists uh, to make this project. And for me, it's also something that could, could be sustainable because I translate, I hope I do that, but I try to translate the knowledge um, of scientists, which is something really urgent, urgent. Uh, and to give more information to the spectator, because I think um, that some scientific articles are really impenetrable, because it's really complicated. So I really try to speak uh, about that. So here it's about the collapse of the biodiversity in Brittany, um, about all this toxic algae that become toxic because of the intensive uh, agriculture and because of the waste of the intensive agriculture <coughs> and so the algae are producing a gaze and this gaze is killing all the biodiversity and it's also uh, asphyxiating for human uh, it's a gaze which is very deadly so it's a bit problematic in Britannia but the thing is that politically it's so hidden and so complicated so even during the project with scientists, uh, a lot of things was forbidden to capture as a photographer. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, I used fiction as something um, to show a reality that I was forbidden to show. And I thought it was interesting. I never used fiction and narratives like that. Uh, and so here it's a mi microscope image that I like because it could remind an eye or something like that, it's really organic. Um, but yeah, this kind of images is totally fictional, but I was not allowed to go on the dead zones. So dead zone is zone when you have no oxygen anymore. So the organisms which are living there could live only because they are resilient to the non-oxygen life. And so this kind of, of zone is for sure very dangerous but we could go there with a big mask. But even uh, if we have all the materials, I was not allowed to go at the last minute because they didn't want me to document this kind of landscape because it's not nice to know. I mean, for sure, they want to keep their touristical um, things, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah. And yeah, this kind of uh, picture are also important and I think it could be also used in a sustainable way because this picture, for example, become a proof, a proof, proof, yeah, um, to be against the government with this problematic, to prove that there is putrefication on uh, the soil in Brittany because of this black thing you see, it's putrefication. So when the image can become a proof, it's also something interesting, I think. Uh, also, I'm a co-founder of a collective that is De Anima, and we also try to find other solutions. So we are researchers, scientists, scenographers, um, designer, uh, and me as a photographer. And we try to find solutions to product installation with no waste, which is, which is difficult. But uh, the thing is to recycling everything, to take only materials that we found, and also to work with the living nature and the living could evolve on uh, the installation. So for example, here, it's um, an installation about the language of the mushrooms. And so we create a machine that is capable to keep all the electromagnetic sound of mushrooms present on the installation. 
But the mushrooms are still evolving. So if you come at the beginning of the installation, it, it will be not the same that at the end. So we did many projects. If you want to know more, we can talk uh, after. Yeah. So yes, it was the first uh, our first installation on the garage. And maybe you saw the first at Unbound in Amsterdam. Uh, and here, yeah, it was like 200 pieces of brick of mushrooms evolving during three months on, the, on this garage. And it was amazing because at the end, uh, the mushrooms were so big. And uh, yes, and it was really also with the link with the movie we did that is criticizing the artificial uh, uh, grow up of the mushrooms. So yeah, everything has a link. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. It's very interesting to see art mixing with culture, mixing with fiction and the storytelling there. So we'll dive into some questions later. And I would like to pass to Daniel to share his work. OK. okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Hinks. Uh, I'm originally from the, the UK, but I currently uh, live and work in China. Uh, which is where this uh, whole project is based and uh, it talks about ocean plastic pollutions along the uh, Chinese coastline of particularly of the uh, Shandong Peninsula which is where I live and has been uh, affected mostly in that area by uh, ocean plastic pollutions and rising sea levels etc etc so um, this, this project itself is all based uh, around around that and I want to talk about these issues not just as a problem of the, the Chinese a Chinese problem but a problem about the whole world is facing right you know and how uh, by by 20 by 2050 there's going to be more plastic in the sea than fish by weight now what does that say about the way that we're going? If we don't look at changing our ways and becoming more sustainable or doing something, or, you know, what kind of future are we going to have? So this whole project is talking a lot about all of these things and how we're going to develop and sustain, uh, sustain the future. So okay, I'd like to uh, start with uh, our... Okay, so as you'll see later, the, these uh, are the photographs that are going to be uh, in, in the exhibition, and as you can see, uh, they are uh, quite, quite creative uh, in, their, in, in the approach, because I, I believe that uh, telling a story of uh, contemporary issues also needs a thought-provoking and contemporary way of working, due to the, the nature of ocean pollution and the, the climate crisis. We we, we, we see these photographs and this kind of thing all the time and I feel that we've become desensitized to it and we're kind of ignoring the issues because of the images that we're constantly seeing, we constantly see. Like, for example, uh, if, if we look at uh, uh, like starvation and poverty uh, or like in, in Africa, people see that and they're so used to it that they don't even think of the, the, the problem lies there. So I wanted to create work that brought the viewer back to actually changing their m frame of mind and their way of looking at the world and actually making them stop and think and then hopefully to act and move forward with what they're doing uh, in, 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 the, in the future. So actually uh, we are talking about sustainability, but also I would like to um, bring it back to the photographer, us that make the work, and the commitment and the sustainability of us actually getting up and going out and doing these projects over a period of time. So these are some of the things that I want to talk about, and I'm very... Um, happy and uh, thankful for uh, sh sh sharing uh, the, the stage with such great people 
uh, and great organisers and best of the festival and everything and giving me a chance to talk and show my work here today and hopefully give you guys a perspective on well, what's going on in China and like the other parts of, uh, of, of, of the world that you might not see so much or hear about or at least when you hear it you hear certain aspects or sides of it you know, so uh, yeah I want to bring it back to the photographer and what it takes for us photographers to get up and do that work with the ups and the downs of everything you know between publications or uh, you know you know uh, the constant struggle of trying to produce the work and get the work out there and seen so uh, th this is something that I would uh, want to, to talk about and look at uh, I also uh, look at using um, found uh, pieces uh, of plastic and ocean pollutions within the imagery um, and these are this obviously, as you can see, this is all cutlery that uh, is constantly washing up, and I, I, all of these I collected uh, within about ten minutes. Like I'm, I know, joke, it's, you know, they're there, uh, and um, in between all of the objects, I, I want I want us to realise that the problem isn't just the pollution; the problem is us, that we have to change, right? The problem is us. It all stems from us, and most of the uh, pollution that comes from the sea all starts on land. Then it goes into into our rivers and uh, and, and then into our oceans, and so it all stems from us. And then mismanagement of waste. So there's definitely something that we need to do about this, and how do we move forward? So okay, so. Uh, here, like I say, facts, figures, policy and production and, and what comes after. So all of the work that I do do with these photographs, as creative uh, as it is, it's all fact driven. I, I read, gov read government, um, government papers and all different uh, policies and things like that and actually take the, the facts and then use those as part of the driving force of the work to end to add a deeper level so in, in, in the captions of the photographs there will be all this deeper information about things that are actually happening uh, uh, to for us to see and move forward basically. So the work itself is actually created uh, using uh, acetate sheets then uh, print like, printed images onto acetate sheets, and then using uh, ocean pollutants that have came up from the sea. I collect those, then layer the images with this, and then uh, uh, put lighting underneath and rephotograph on top. So this and this is the result that you see uh, with uh, a lot of uh, the, the, the burn marks almost from the printer when it's uh, come through which gives the aesthetic again of a more polluted sort of Im Im imagery. Uh, so this was a, clearly an intentional thing for us to start to look at it uh, in a different way, so rather than just seeing your straightforward reportage style imagery. And for, for, for the things like here with all of the, the found items, I wanted to put them all together just for you to, sh to, just so that you can see the amounts of these things that are washing up and are there constantly um, and give you a break and a, from the other style of imagery, uh, but to, to drive home the fact of what is showing and what is washing up at the, at the sea. Um, and yeah, so uh, and so this is this is my I think my final slide. Um, and this the, these are the fishing do uh, docks that are actually uh, this is just as as the close fishing season shuts down. They shut down for three and a half months from May first to September fifteenth, I, I believe. Um, to help replenish fish fish stocks and things like that, and actually allow, um, like to, to basically to keep it sustainable 
so that there is constantly enough to keep up with the demand of fish uh, as well. So the, there's, there's a lot of areas that I'm trying to touch with this project that maybe not, maybe doesn't come through directly in the Im imagery, uh, but is there within the text when uh, given. So um, that yeah, that, that that's uh, that's all for me. And, um, Thank you very much, and I look forward to you know, talking with all of you and uh, going on further. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'll explore further this role of artists and activists in as we dive into this discussion. But I would love to pass it to you, Shishtop, to hear your very, uh, as you say, you're going to take us into the out of the universe. <laughs> First of all, thank you for fulfilling my dream. I always dream to have a, a festival and a talk in a teepee tent. That's an amazing, <laughs> sustainable idea to do. Um, yeah, ready to copy. I think we are going to bring the teepee uh, to, to tent to our festivals. I would like to talk very briefly, uh, since we have 10 minutes, about uh, certain big picture of sus sustainability, which is... Uh, um, which is uh, happening because of the uh, threat of extinction and uh, the cri all the crises that we are um, going through at the moment. So it will be like a 10 minutes uh, um, a synopsis of, of two days workshops that, uh, that I do on sustainability and social and environmental responsibility. So where to start? Uh, I would like to give you a big picture, really big picture, the biggest possible, that the universe uh, is uh, if you can read this number, 30 billion, uh, 13 billion years old. And uh, there are two trillion, can, can anyone? Yeah, trillion uh, observable galaxies. But more than 94% of them that were captured by James Webb Telescope do not exist anymore. anymore. Uh, every galaxy includes uh, from 100 uh, billion to 400 billion stars and to travel just to the first galaxy takes 11 million light years so extinction is really nat natural process in this universe and extinction that we are uh, experiencing now it's it's a very small scale extinction is happening on daily basis we can see it and this is Actually, I wanted to, for a moment, like Alice, bring you to a little bit non-human perspective of extinction. Uh, as you can see, this is the, the life uh, span of the Earth, and 99.99999% per uh, of evolution on Earth is non-human. We are this 0.00001% of li life evolution on the planet. So that was the big picture, uh, yes, that I would like to, just to have a context. What is sustainability and extinction? And that we are talking only about this uh, tiny percent of our time in, uh, on planet Earth, if we can move forward. And what is happening, what we are facing. So you can see that from 1970, from just, just uh, uh, in a time of 50 years, we lost almost 70% of species in the planet. This, this is incredible to, to, to picture this one, million, uh, one, one, one billion uh, years of evolution that was washed away in 50 years. So, yes, it is really what scientists call the sixth mass, uh, massive extinction and you know, it's really difficult. It's of course, if we are probably more like guardian readers, we are more conscious. We are talking now to the bubble, but this these headlines do not go to really main, mainstream news. But I was really uh, my intention was to show the scale of extinction, and now I will show a little bit of few cliche images that we see very briefly. Uh, to uh, can we go back to show that next that we are really watching live uh, extinction. This happens every 60, 70 million years. It's really, 
prime time. <laughs> and I would like to see this not as a climate change, not as a biodiversity uh, crisis. It's really one holistic crisis that is made of many small crises. And it's biodiversity cli crisis, the climate change. Uh, it's all uh, sort of uh, uh, combined um, uh, planetary crisis. And I also, that's my intention also to picture this in this way, in a very holistic way. So we are both uh, perpetrators and victims of this environmental crisis. We are causing it and we are suffering of it. 20% of Amazon rainforest has been already fully destroyed and we cannot recover that, we cannot re regenerate. Over 90% of global uh, wildland fires are man-made. Only 10% have natural causes. Only in 2021 in Brazil, there were 184,000 uh, of wildfire, uh, wildfires outbreaks. Indonesia area bur um, burned in the last five years uh, a, a space that is larger than Holland, just in one year. This is familiar. Uh, ten, uh, 100 million marine uh, animals die each year from plastic waste. And the majority of consumed fish that we, we eat now consists already of microplastic, it's micro, microfibers. So, how far we can go? So, actually, I, I brought this card, which says hope. And I want to be hopeful for the second five minutes. So, this is the image for now that I would like to keep. Can we keep this image just for you for 15 seconds to integrate this data? Let's go hopefully. Yeah. So, mm, can you? Uh, in the 20th century, um, uh, Arne Nest created the concept of deep ecology, you might be very familiar in Scandinavian countries, that, uh, because sustainability very often stay also as a tool, only a very practical tool to somehow also instrumental way to feed the same structures, the same mechanism, the same kind of capitalistic way of thinking. And deep ecology is the concept and philosophical um, uh, idea behind that we don't treat ecology as a tool, to, as an instrument to, to fulfill uh, further needs. Ecology, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an environmental philosophical concept and it's not a, a tool to, to abuse further or less other species. So that was the very beginning of, uh, of, of, of a very deep environmental thinking and uh, you might be familiar with TJ Demos and the concept of decolonizing na nature that is also going farther from the idea of giving certain tools and to discussing the, the post-anthropocentric uh, uh, policies that we can create and creating like a, a way artists are really very close to become activists by themselves and it, this uh, concept uh, brings art activism with art and uh, I really uh, encourage you, it's a really interesting book called Decolonizing Nature. And um, I didn't want to talk a lot about solutions because this will be the part of the workshop that we will go outside the tent, but there's a tiny few slides about this just to give also the, the, the scale and the, the big picture, like in terms of the greenhouse gases emissions, if you would like to really cover a footprint that we um, that we discuss, so footprint of one person from the global uh, global north. Uh, uh, it's if you would, we would need to plant twenty hectares of forest for each person if you would like to cover our own footprint. That's the reality. That's that's the balance. So the carbon neutral economy is really a fiction here, but we 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 can still. Um, create some solutions and that's the context of what really is creating a greenhouse effect and it's mainly industrial pollution, electricity, animal farms and agriculture 20%, transportation and then in the end uh, heating and cooling and freezing. 
So the solutions are both technological, economical. We want to uh, avoid, at the moment, creating like massive technologies that will absorb uh, carbon, carbon dioxide and algae are like one of the main solutions at the moment. Uh, so biodegradable, biodegradable carbon uh, neutral plastic, carbon neutral uh, cement, renewable clean energy, plant-based alternatives, carbon free transportation. So this is really a uh, technological side, but it won't happen without mental and social uh, solutions, which comes first, if you can come back. Yeah, reducing emissions by changing consumption be behaviors, and this is why we are here discussing it, radical change in our lifestyle habits, and really massive educational promotional uh, projects that make sustainability a mainstream, not only a bubble. And yeah, that requires the broader change of the society to, to creating a growth economy, to uh, happiness economy, and uh, um, a common economy for common good against uh, capitalistic uh, uh, models. And in the very end, I would like to show you this five laws of sustainability uh, by Billy Commoner, and that everything is connected to everything else. Everything must be, go somewhere. Night, nature knows best. Everything takes time and energy. And if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. And this part is about sustainable activism, that we need to have hopeful and sustainable uh, attitude to, towards uh, uh, this radical change. And I think this is the the only healthy way to face this crisis. I think that's more or less this. If this we can discuss uh, later the, during the workshop what the art sector can do. Because uh, uh, can you can you come back? Do I have still one minute? We're over time. Ah, okay. So thirty seconds. Yeah, thirty seconds. <laughs> An average cultural institution uses four hundred grams of paper a year. So this is equivalent of thirty medium sized uh, trees. An average art festival produces 500 kilograms of plastic, so it's equivalent of uh, uh, 50,000 plastic bottles. And also, like to come here, I feel also a little bit guilty. I came from Poland at Lou. So also, like I, I would love to plant some trees uh, in the summer, <laughs> but we, it's it's good to be mindful. What is the real cost of uh, of uh, cultural activities? Yes, and these are the workshops that we are running as a future, so I would like you also to follow the future photography platform. You will know more about the workshops that are happening in Lodz, Poland at the moment, and in Budapest, and so on. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the sustainability development goals as well. We wanted them to think about that. Uh, if you are working, how could you work with, you know, in your environmental footprint at that time, they were called a footprint. Uh, later on, it's the CO2. Um, and social responsibility, how will you as a company take social responsibility? So I've been working with that. Uh, then it's, it's true, I've been involved in the Roskilde Festival. Uh, personally, I was standing out in, a, in another project, it was called the Makerspace. Uh, at that time, something called Orange Innovation existed. Uh, some of you might know it. Um, we were making a Makerspace uh, just for fun, really, having the festival guests come and uh, come and, and uh, make something out of their you know, trash or whatever they had. And then we were in the end uh, of the festival, we were not able to get away with it or not even sort it. Uh, and on that basis, I made a project uh, that came up all the way at Ruskell Festival and we made a whole new strategy for uh, uh, sorting waste, uh, motivating uh, festival guests all around, like, uh, and I think there are like 80,000 participants, uh, so we had a big task on our hand, and they're drunk, uh, <laughs> so the time. <laughs> uh, so a lot about figuring out how to do that, uh, notching, uh, putting up the right systems, making it fun, uh, because sometimes they were tired, they were drunk, they were whatever. Uh, I also did that at other festivals, and some of the way of encouraging these festival guests to sort their waste and making it fun was using art. So we did different projects, uh, art projects, uh, for them to throw or whatever, use the trash. Yeah. Um, then I've been head of uh, projects at a festival called Tomorrow Festival that doesn't exist anymore, but we try to it was really a festival that had a focus, like a really positive mindset on encouraging both us as individuals. So how can we uh, make changes in our everyday life? We have, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but a um, regular Danish person, we have a CO2 uh, emission each year on 18,000 tons. It's a lot, it's one of the highest in the world. So we need to do something both as individuals, but we also need to do something as companies. So at tomorrow, we had different projects for individuals, again, using the art uh, to try to convince through senses, uh, fun, uh, how you say, the feelings really to, to, um, to not just in, in another direction, for example, to eat more plant-based, uh, think about uh, how we live, energy use, all these things. If you're interested, you can come ask. Um, yeah, and now I'm... Uh, Head of Sustainability at Louisiana, that's right. Uh, still new, um, but at Louisiana we are we are to make a whole new sustainability strategy, uh, looking into CO2 emissions. And I think when you're on that level, you have to look into where is the biggest impact, and then go go from there. Really. Um, so people visiting Louisiana might wonder why are there still plastic cups, why are there still plastic bags, and all these things. And it's because we have to look at the places where it matters the most. And then we work our way uh, down to, to the smaller things. Um, and I can talk a lot about that, but I won't bother you with that. But how it is working as a sustainability manager at Louisiana is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place to work. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm very curious to, to dive into the mindset, as you say, and some of the nudging pieces later on of how do you make that shift for such a big institution that's known um, so well. Um, but I will pass it on for the, our last one, Jakob, um, to share about what it's like to be a co-founder and director of Better <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it. Better to get culture to know which could be translated oh, into sustainable culture life now. Uh, well, how does it feel to be the co-director, co-founder and director, but it feels so busy and I get uh, more and more, you know, bags under my eyes because we're really busy, which is great in a way because um, we are demanded. People need our help as an organization, which is great, but our goal, our main goal is to become unemployed because we want all cultural workers in Denmark and in the Nordic region to be self-sufficient with knowledge uh, on climate literacy, for instance, um, so we don't have to deliver that. Um, 
yeah. So uh, so I'm tired, but I'm really happy to be here, and I'm I get so um, I I get filled with hope when I see artists who actually translate these very difficult. Uh, um, paradoxes that we're facing into something that is relatable that can be felt by our minds and hearts so thank you for that um, uh, I, I want to start somewhere completely different because um, first of all I want to ask all of you in here how many have read the latest IPC report if you read it raise your hands if you read 10% of it raise your hands oh we got one <laughs> two three four five yeah okay great how many of you have enjoyed culture today? Raise your hands if you have enjoyed some kind of culture today. Look around. Right there is the answer to this, one of the big questions that we're facing. How can we really um, speed up the process of this sustainable transition that we have to undergo as societies today? Arts and culture has the key to this transition because we can present new narratives in the audience's hearts and minds, and if you can imagine a sustainable future, you can create it. The last IPCC report said specifically that the reason why we are not further ahead with the sustainable transition in the EU is due to the lack of art and uh, culture in the whole process. We are not there yet. We have to live up to our full potential as cultural producers. So this is something that we're working very specifically on in Bæredygtig Kultur Lundu, which is an organization that was founded three years ago, uh, first there by the demand in the performing arts uh, industry in Denmark. There was a huge demand for knowledge um, and some kind of movement. So uh, we were set out there in the beginning, three years ago, as an organization working to create knowledge on sustainable production in the performing arts sector. We reached out to uh, Julie's Bicycle, which, which is a charity and NGO from the UK, who has more than 15 years of experience working with the whole cultural sector in the UK. And they really uh, cracked the nut, if you can say that. Um, they created this collaboration with Arts Council uh, England, which is to be a little bit compared to Staten's Kunstfund in Denmark, but not really compared. It's like, it's like a, yeah, it, it is what it says, Arts Council England. It's where you apply for funding if you're a big concert venue, a museum, a gallery, a theater. What they did there is that they demand that every time you apply for annual funding, you have to deliver a climate um, annual climate report in order to get funding. No matter to what, uh, uh, what thing you're getting funded for, you have to uh, create a climate report. And this has really sped up the process, can you say that? Sped? Yeah, sped up the process in the UK. Um, they have really uh, set sustainability on the agenda, uh, creating a massive um, uh, cut on emissions uh, with the large cultural institutions, but also they really saved some money, which then can be used on creating culture, because they really lowered the climate footprint of the large uh, buildings such as the National Theatre or like big venues, they really lower the climate impact on the everyday use of the buildings. And this gives more money to culture, so we can create more culture. We really borrowed and stole a lot of great ideas from them. We were standing on the shoulder of giants. That's why we've been able here in Denmark and in the Nordic region to move so fast with this small organization. We compare ourselves to a bumblebee because there is, you know, this idea of a bumblebee that actually can't fly, it, but it doesn't know it does it anyways. So this is how we work. We're basically just a very, very small organization who kicked in an open door to a cultural sector who really demands a change. And what we're doing is basically that we are um, connecting the dots. Because one important thing here is that we know everything we need to know already. All the knowledge is out there. All the ideas, all the codes of conduct, all the practical advices, they are there already. And then the question is, but why hasn't anything then happened in, in a faster pace than it has? And the reason why, to our belief, is that right now we're all waiting. Everybody's waiting for somebody to say, let's do it. We witnessed it during COVID. In Denmark, the prime minister, within six hours, closed down the country. It happened. It worked. Everybody changed their behavior. We could do it. And we're in a massive scale, way worse than COVID with this climate crisis. So we need to act just as fast. So what we're working on in Bæredygtig Kultur Lionu 
is to demand from our politicians, our political legislators, our political decision makers, that they start making the rules. That they say to us now, you need to work like this. This is the new code of conduct. This is your new normal. But what we then realize is that the political decision makers, they are waiting because they're scared of not getting enough votes if they put this thing on us. So it is our responsibility to reach out to our political legislators and say to them what we want and what we need, meaning what kind of rules would be beneficial to us, what kind of resources would we need. A great example is that we're working with the municipality of Aarhus. They decided that uh, in the next years, all cultural institutions who receive more than one million Danish crowns a year, uh, they should start climate reporting. So they create this uh, prototyping where we decided on eight different cultural institutions from Aarhus Festu to Vauxhall Concert Venue to Svalegarten Theatre, very different uh, cultural institutions. Those eight were, were put together in one room with the municipality of Aarhus and us as knowledge partners. And we sat down and started to identify what kind of rules would work for you and how could you help each other with um, a gaining no and knowledge between you? How could you share materials? How could you share storage space? How can you really help each other? And how can the municipality of Aarhus, how can they actually help you so they don't only demand? So it's like we have this saying in Denmark, you have the carrot and you have the whip, and we really have to use both now. So the, especially the, the government and the municipalities, they have to give us the carrot and say, if you start climate reporting, for instance, we will help you with these resource courses or knowledge, uh, climate literacy, where you raise your knowledge. We can help you with that. We have money for that. Um, but we will also whip you if you don't act now. Um, so I just want to—I want to add one more thing because I'm—I'm uh, I'm really hopeful when I'm sitting here with you right now because you are, as I just said before, you're really translating what scientists have been saying for like the last 50 years into something that can be felt so we can be moved by it. Uh, I myself uh, started out as an actor 15 years ago, and I've always, as a professional actor, been working with, with the sustainability and the climate crisis. And I was a part of a show called Democracy, where we toured around Denmark um, in all the mayor's houses in each municipality, more than 30 municipalities, uh, with a show called Democracy. It was a part of the local municipality elections, so it was during the election campaign so we were really out there where it happened. And one of the, uh, one of the scenes from this uh, show, Democracy, was called uh, Jakob's Climate Fight. And it was basically where I hijacked the whole show. And I, you know, I would, I would get up and I would say, sorry guys, I can't take it anymore. Fuck the politicians, I can't wait for them anymore because they're not doing what they said they should. So now it's your chance to ask me or say to me what I should do and I will do it. So I was basically, you know, you know, I was changing the whole uh, concept of a, what a show is, what theater is. I was basically just saying, tell me what I have to do, and I will do it. Not as an actor, but private. Jakob will do it now. And then the, the audiences came with great ideas like stop buying or uh, go vegan. And I would say, yes, great. And uh, yeah, you might have said go vegan. Then I would come over to you and I would say, okay, but if I am to make a climate agreement, we have to be two in this. Otherwise, it's not an agreement. So can you, be, can you go vegan with me? And people would cheer and we would make climate agreements every night. And then the very interesting thing was, because we had to turn this into something that's funny, because climate and cr the climate crisis is not per se very sexy. It isn't, I have to say. Um, <laughs> it isn't. So how can we make it fun? So every night uh, at the end of the show, we would see if, see if we could make a common climate agreement, everybody in the room. And on this tour, we, we visited 30 cities. The first night was in Copenhagen and they were like, what can we agree on? They even had a hard time agreeing on to stop using plastic bags because everybody would have to agree. And they were like, yeah, no, maybe it's difficult. Three nights into the tour, we were in, um, in Helsingør, in the north of Sjælland. And there we could say, oh, guys and girls, yesterday we were in Aarhus. They said three uh, meat-free days a week. You can do better than that. And then everybody were like, yeah, we can do better than that. And so we, we documented it every night with really taking pictures and everybody signed up to this um, Facebook group back then, it's, uh, it's some years ago. Um, so very fast, we had more than a thousand really um, very active users in the group who were living up to the climate agreements and uh, holding me in my ears because I had to live up to mine. Uh, one of the biggest challenges was to change the, 
what do you call a pension scheme? Uh, yeah, what do you call that in, in English? Pension. Retirement plan. How to? How could I change the where I had put my money in the retirement? I don't have a retirement plan. For God's sake, I'm an actor, so I don't have any money. No, but, but 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 I still the idea, right? So so basically, um, I'm just saying that this really gave me hope, and and we have we have this uh, motto in Bertudit Kultur, you know, which is the price for hope is action meaning that we also work a lot with educations cultural institutions and educations and we have a lot of young students who have climate anxiety and the best medicine there is action i witnessed it myself four years ago where i had the climate anxiety you know if you start doing it helps you that's the medicine um you know i could go on forever so i'm going to stop now but yeah. please come and ask me for anything <coughs> i will answer hopefully the best i can yeah thank you